we wanted to start first because uh, the theme this year, because it's the 60th anniversary for the Conference Vistage Ingrat, uh, we have a, a special theme and it's, uh, I don't know if anyone noticed, but it's about participation and ethics. So I think you covered it very well. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a lot of reflections to, to keep on going, but we thought, the committee thought that first maybe we could have your thoughts about, we talked about participation, we saw some models, we talked about full participation, we talked about engagement, there were many concepts that were uh, discussed. We wanted to know, or I have a common idea about what we could uh, think is optimal participation. And maybe you, you did. As and defined by who, though, is the question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the healthcare professional or the consumer, right? Yeah. No, the, or the just make like, sure we all have a, if we discuss about participation, we wanted to have the discussion about the optimal participation. So make sure we all have a, a common definition of the term first. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> you seem to have some thoughts. <laughs> Victor, are you oh, oh, you're looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> I saw your eyes. Oh, okay. Is that okay? Um, no. okay it's not working. working. It's not working. It's not working. Okay, next. <laughs> um, I think that it's hard to think about optimal participation as a single point in time. Mm -hmm that it really is a process, and it really changes. Um, if not from hour to hour, frankly, for some people maybe from hour to hour, um, depending on what type of disability you have. And I think it's like, oh, what's that song about? Something is a state of mind. Um, it is. You know, I, I think so, but um, one of the concepts that I wanted to introduce here was the dignity of risk concept. And I don't know whether people are kind of familiar with that. Um, Have you guys heard that term? Risk with dignity? Term, dignity of risk. And risk? The dignity of risk. It's that, a very big term in the United States. It's a very States. big term in the United States, yeah. Where basically um, people with disabilities may make informed choices because of their own preferences to do something that maybe professionals just don't think is the right thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think of optimal social participation as really totally reflecting what the person themselves wants to do. And I understand that there are people in here who are really interested in cognitive and developmental disabilities and that there may be some cognitive impairment overlays that could, um, could perhaps uh, affect and also, we haven't really talked about um, emotional health and mental health as a disability very much this afternoon. Mm -hmm. But in the United States, in terms of getting on to the disability rules, quote unquote, for Social Security, it really toggles between um, musculoskeletal disorders and mental health as being the two leading causes. And so those might be affected. But um, I really, as somebody with a disability, um, I really feel that um, that the healthcare professionals, frankly, you don't have all the evidence yet mm -hmm. to know whether what you are doing is help is going to be helpful to me. And therefore, um, for you really to prove to yourself, to me, that you say that the treatment that you want to give to me is going to be optimal, I really want to be able to make a decision that no, I don't think so. I want to do something else. Mm -hmm. so. You want to add something? Well, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> the um, philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No. Whether or not I have an argument, I always have an opinion. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I must admit that whoever came up with that question cost me a couple of nights of yeah. sleep. Um, this one really did my head in yeah. many ways. Um, and. I mean, partly, I, I totally agree with yeah. what you said about contextualization and about um, looking at this as something in between stages of life and so on and so forth. My biggest concern was always this idea that op optimal participation, optimal anything in this sort of sector shouldn't be defined from the outside. Mm -hmm. 
So to me, as a sort of philosopher slash deliberative democrat, whatever you want to call it, I see this as an engagement of society, an engagement of people together in communities, in different sort of groups. And to me, I mean, I, I, I learned a lot from your three sort of four E's. And <laughs> I missed one, I knew I missed one. <laughs> so, but I think the key point about optimal participation is, since it is an ongoing development, since it's something that will change across lifetimes, across times in the society as well. I mean, for example, we now live in a crisis, you know, which is going to have an impact, like it or not, on particular people's resources and so on and so forth. The one thing you don't want is basically one group losing out. And one way to try and secure this not losing out is by things like enfranchisement, which is something I focused on, and I think, you know, well, mostly you focused on as well, but it's, it's obviously implicit in the comment that you were saying here. So that's kind of my take on it. So no definite answer, but then you wouldn't expect that from us. Yeah, I think you're seeing us react to the term optimal, right? Um, in that I, I think it's a dangerous term at times, right? Because I could see somebody then wanting a Roche analyzed scale of who is a good participator yes. and who is not, and making some assumptions about why not in that they're not motivated enough to do this or to start to blame it on what's inside their body, you know, kind of thing. as as some of that um, optimization, shall we say, measurement, right? So I, I think it's more the term optimal. You know, so sometimes we've we've used full, we've used just every, you know participation in everyday life. What does it mean to you? What's important to you? As opposed to you know like an optimal or, or like there there is no best way to participate is what we've seen. And even every time we try to do it from a testing and measurement standpoint, it fails miserably on participation. We can, we can measure function in that way, but participation is so unique and so individualized as to what means full or meaningful participation to people that we know frequency isn't it, we know just engagement isn't, isn't measuring as a construct. The only thing we've seen is this enfranchisement values about whether or not you feel like you're participating and you're a member of that community is, is as far, and we were excited to even see as a scale, wow, that did actually have some, something we could say about participation for people um, that, that talked about what was easiest or hardest mm -hmm. for people to do, right, versus optimal performance versus, and, and not, right? So, Bob. Any comments? Any thoughts? Anyone? Yes? Back to the point again. Um, when we're referring to full or optimal participation with people with disabilities, do we consider that people without disabilities are fully participating? <laughs> Just because I saw that scale with the hardest on the bottom, and I thought, well, that looks very hard, and I don't know how many people in real life really make it to, to the, the bottom of that list. And maybe people with disabilities, if they've advocated and then empowered themselves, maybe they could teach other people about participating. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> a strength of that community that perhaps they, they this is an asset um, that they are very good at strategizing that and could teach other people about it. Um, but I would, I would agree with you that when we made the scale, um, interestingly, the funder wanted it specific to people with disabilities. But we went in with the disability community and they said, well, we'd also like to do this with people living in poverty or by different gender or age and see, are they enfranchised? Like, we want to look at it as different social groups and whether they have enfranchisement. So the values were, to a large extent, non-disability, actually, on this one, that it could apply to lots of different groups. And, and not everybody's enfranchised, right? It's an issue for lots of folks in society. In front first yeah. and after. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. The trip. Um, um, my question is not actually a question. I would like to know your feedback. Um, uh, I work. I am a physiotherapist, and I work uh, with a you know called your rehab. And I realize that in so many situations, and uh, with people with uh, they recover from a different treatment, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, um, functionally they are. Uh, no disabled actually. They have a lot of troubles participating and reintegrating the society and uh, yeah. it's huge. I'm really talking about people with, uh, let's say, early stage that they recover 
physically and medically fully. But mentally or emotionally, maybe not. So maybe what are your, your feedback from that? And I'm, let me give you an example. Someone that, uh, <clears throat> that have surgery, I don't know, radiation, let's say, and after two years, uh, medic medically is free of cancer, free of uh, no treatments, and, uh, but still not able to work or to study or to doing what they were, they were doing before. So what are your, your comments or your, what do you think about that situation? It's true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Because I try to get the help well, of people, yeah. but there are, it's hard. It's, sometimes yeah. they don't, I feel that they don't want to move on, or they are barriers that is, um, is yeah, I don't know how to, to, to deal that sometimes with that type of issues. That it's hard. Because you I wonder if the healthcare system, though, is contributing to that, um, that we don't look at cancer as a, as, as a long-term disability. In fact, we try to distance it as much as we can from it, right? You know, that it's, a, it's an event that we can treat, and we haven't spent anywhere near as much time on long-term living with that, you know, long-term disability living kinds of things, right? And so I'm not even sure that people with cancer even know that this is an issue, right? That they're even aware that participation might get affected. And by the time they do it, there's nobody talking about it during, during their rehab or, or in yes. any way bringing it up or showing them models of it. I'm sure you've read the book by Julie Silver. Um, the physiatrist in the United States who herself had breast cancer. You should read this. Has, has anybody read Julie Silver's work? She's an MD. She had breast cancer. She's a physiatrist. And she, um, she's really been trying to kind of ride the wave of, um, of post-cancer rehabilitation um, to do exactly, exactly what you were talking about. Um, and I think that um, that we're using the word disability for something that probably the people who are experiencing the situation might not welcome the word disability right. to describe what they're experiencing. And so I think that, um, that all I can say is I just know this because I know Julie and, and I know that, that she's been out there on the hustings really trying to make a point about this, but I would be very concerned about using the word disability here. I also have found in my work with older people, um, the kind of uh, much older people, the geriatrics community, that the word disability is not welcomed. And it actually can very much put people off um, from recognizing the kinds of things that we want to um, talk about here could be um, helpful to them in improving their daily lives, but they, they very much um, reject the whole notion of disability. So I don't know, Joy, whether. Just like look at some of the, the yeah. self-management approaches right, here, right? Exactly. Because again, Kate Lorig and that group right. reframes it in a way that it's not, they don't even use the terms disability right, or not. Exactly. And you I, know, they just say what's happening in your life, what's affecting you, what's limiting you from doing something, and then you land up working on it as a goal, you know, kind of right. thing. And disability doesn't even enter the terminology exactly. necessarily. And I think in the United States, quite frankly, I mean, you're looking at, I mean, there's a slight frown between the eyebrows there. <laughs> this is, that we're not giving you the answer that you want. Um, <laughs> that that a, lot of, a lot of the concern in our country is driven by what people will pay for, what programs will pay for, and kind of long-term, kind of, to even get a physical therapy appointment for me, I have to go to a physiatrist and I'm given seven visits and then maybe they'll let me have. My point is that something like what you're talking about, I don't think has yet kind of been accepted by the payer community as something that's worth paying for. Could I, could I add something to this? Uh, I, I liked your idea of the gray zone, so I have bad news for you. The gray zone exists, right? It's, it's not going to be put there by, by introducing a concept. So. So I think one, I think what that concept does to me, and I, I wasn't aware of it, but I think it's a fascinating thing, Boba, but it chimes with something that I've been always worried about, which is that, um, you know, we can reduce risk to the point where it doesn't exist, but that has an immense yeah. cost. cost. Exactly. And it's a cost that exactly. we would never yeah. right. burden right. non-disabled people with. Right. But suddenly when you're disabled, it's okay. Think about children. I mean, we do not test parents in the way you would test, you know, the sort of reactions that we've, we've seen, and I'm sure you have plenty more stories. I mean, you know, I mean, 
Okay. Uh, I was just in Sheffield with staying with a friend of mine who has a young son and they're an absolutely lovely couple and they, they love their child dearly and we had a barbecue and myself and my partner spent most of the evening being extremely nervous about this kid running around in an environment where it could fall off this and bump into that and there was barbecues all over the place and you know I mean I was so happy I could go to bed because I was like <laughs> my stress levels were up there. Now I mean you know I mean, this is, you know, I mean, these are both academics, so we all assume that they're, you know, but if this was a disabled person, suddenly the child protection comes in and says, no, risk assessment, blah, blah, blah. So, so I think that really is that angle. Everything has a cost and we need to put the line somewhere. And I agree, you know, and the law provides for very clear cases such as things to do with cars and so on and so forth. But there is, you know, we, we, we very happily push against one border, we don't realize the opposite side. And I think that's what the concept is supposed to be doing. Let, let me give you a little of the history of risk with dignity and where it came from. Um, in the United States, it came um, when people with disabilities were being institutionalized and put into nursing homes. And then um, they used the Americans with Disabilities Act to say, this is a violation of my civil rights. Um, not a safety risk issue, completely. They said this is a civil rights violation of my choice as a citizen in this society to live with the rest of the community. Um, and then that's when, because of that, that, that Supreme Court decision, the state and our funders had to then say, you can't just deem somebody unsafe. You cannot say they can't go home because they're unsafe. That's actually a legal violation of their rights. And so instead what they said is do the risk assessment and actually figure out what the supports would be. And you'd have to justify any, any kind of nursing home placement now to say that absolutely nothing would help this person, you know, kind of do this, right, you know, kind of thing. So now the onus is on the healthcare professional to say what in the environment would enable them to be as safe as possible and give them that right right, to the least restrictive setting to live in. Um, and the role, it's, it's really shaped, reshaped how I think as an OT. So I still do my safety assessments, but I challenge myself to say, did I just say they're cognitively unsafe and leave them with no recourse? Or did I actually try out a whole bunch of environmental supports, e.g. in a lifeline system, um, you know, like somebody with them and during certain hours of the day, all these things. Did I actually try it and see, did this person really need to be in a nursing home, you know, or not? And in this case now, the disability community would say it's a civil rights violation, right? And that's why they're saying risk with dignity is something for us to challenge us as professionals to say too often they've been deemed unsafe. And then that's the excuse to be put into an institution or to not have a child or whatever the scenario is, right? And there's enough research in the states that tell me nursing homes are not safe places either. I can give you I can give you federal data actually now that tells you about the cases of abuse and neglect and all the things that happen. And so I think it's 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 like there's no one answer here. It's not like you're going to be completely you know risk with dignity on everything. And it's not like you're going to as an OT. What it struck for me is when I work with folks now in the community. I'm I'm looking at being creative as heck on environmental supports now. I am pushing that boundary and I'm justifying it to the state to say, let's try this. You need to give me some resources to be able to try, you know, say an eight hour PA here, you know, or something like that, versus saying this person should be in the nursing home. It's, it's, does that make sense? Like again, it's, it's, it is a clinical judgment, right? Um, kind of thing, but it's also, um, what I like in the states now is they're doing this thing called informed risk management or informed risk management contracting, where it's a professional and done with a consumer, um, you know, like a member of the disability community or the aging community, um, that are sitting down together with the person and talking about all the different supports, you know, that could happen, and then they all agree on a plan at the end. It's like all weighed, but at least the consumer has a voice in that, you know? And again, at the end, they get to select their risk. You know, again, not into the very, if they're at harm to others or something like that, that wouldn't be, you know, happening. That would not be an acceptable informed <laughs> risk contract. 
But for, think about like how many people we put into nursing homes or other places like that, um, that with the environmental supports, really are in violation of their rights at some point. Yeah, I just want to make one highlight, and it, it was about the first question. Maybe the word optimal was not the good one, but what we wanted you to say, and I think you really did a great job at it, is that participation, when you look at the model, they mostly define it as engagement and activities and stuff like that. But I think you highlighted very well the diversity in the population, disability or not, and you highlighted well as well that what full participation or participation is, it, it, it's in relation to individual choices. And that I think that's what we wanted, that everyone had the, the same thinking when we're thinking about participation, because coming from a rehab perspective, the doing, the being able to do, always takes a, a lot of space in the way we envision things. So uh, thank you very much for doing this, and we'll continue with that. Yeah, I'm actually in continuation to what you were saying. As you were speaking, I was thinking, so in a wonderful world with funding and for innovation, etc., we would move into intelligent cities and homes and, uh, and environments such that we would preserve to the extent possible the, uh, the individual in whatever environment they would need to be. And to be honest, you're much better in Canada than we are on this. You push the boundary of risk with dignity much farther. You know, so for you, I can see why it's an ethical dilemma because you've already you're already in the community working with people on these things. In the states, for us, it's just like, do I even get to do a home visit? Right? Does that make sense? Like we're on a different plane. We're far behind you on our thinking. Like risks are just, <laughs> can we take them all? You know, kind of thing to, to do a visit, right? You have nine one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just wondering. They're getting rid of it. <laughs> I think it was cut in budget cuts though. <laughs> Maybe in the President Bush pregnancy, right? <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> but I think we will move on and I'll let you talk. Um, but the next question the committee had come with was exactly like that. Uh, we, you highlighted well as well that the environment, the support, physical or social, will give the opportunity to individuals to fully participate. We wanted you to share with us what are you good at? What, what can we pick up from what you're doing in your different countries or the countries you, you stayed in? <laughs> whatever, whatever you know about whatever country. <laughs> I can I skip this one? <laughs> You've been traveled though. I mean, at the, maybe at the micro level, but also on a larger scale on, uh, about the policies or what are we good at or where can we move on if we here want to take what you're doing and get there. Well, oh gosh. Um, I, I actually, I, this is going to sound really reductionistic, but I actually think transportation is a really big deal. Mm -hmm. Having accessible transportation, because after all, you're not a patient all the time. You're not wanting to be in your bed sick all the time, right? Um, you want to get out and do things. And if you can't drive, like I haven't driven since 1998 because I don't want to kill anybody, I want to have accessible transportation. The Boston subway system opened in 1890. In 2005, the Boston Center for Independent Living won a $321 million judgment against the MBTA because of lack of disability access. And so now I actually have a subway stop near my home and near my workplace that I can, I can just decide when I want to go out and go someplace. And I understand that that's not necessarily true <laughs> around here, that the trains and the subways and the buses are, and I know this sounds just kind of trivial, but actually being able to move around and go places is one in a wheelchair is, is a really, really, really huge deal. And so not that we're perfect at doing this by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that, um, mm -hmm. that we are um, probably better at it than you might be here. Um, I also you don't need to compare though. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> you can't well, tell us what you're well, your question at, was implicitly comparative. 
concerned though, because because I also this is, was one that kind of kept me awake a little bit as well. Because I mean, I I think that um, that we also um, uh, um, well anyway learned some things about the Canadian health system last night that we had actually fully understood, and so I think it's very hard from the outside looking in to really understand what's happening on the ground anywhere. And so um, I can really only talk about my own country and my own situation um, because it's really, really hard as an outsider to really kind of have a full sense of what it's like to live in a particular context. <laughs> I, I will say something later. Yeah. Well, uh, let me use you as an example. I think Canada is incredibly good at assistive technology and home modifications and the justification and the evidence. I use your evidence all the time in the States as a way to push the envelope of what you could do, right? You know, um, kind of thing in terms of OT's involvement in that on a very consistent, you know, kind of basis that you're able to catch people in the community to look at this, you know, kind of thing. So I think, you know, you have many strengths already here, right? I think some of the strengths we bring, you know, from the United States transportation for sure, the disability rights activism yeah. is just so it's darn just, vibrant it's <laughs> really, yeah. that you can't help but catch the energy when you're there, right? You know, and that can be a policy changing event. Yeah. It and, has been and in Massachusetts. We use it a lot in the states and I think we're strong at that you know like we fight a lot you know for rights and things like that and in the end I think it's changed the world for lots of folks not just people with disabilities too so I mean I think that's a strength that we should be affiliating collaborating much more closely we, you know with disability rights communities hand in hand when we try to change policy change funding all these kinds of things do you think that um, some policies would fa favor certain clientele over others, or, or maybe we talked about cancer, maybe that maybe is neglected, or, no, or do you think that it, it, it involves it in, incorporates all client, possible clientele, or if I go a little bit further, do you think that the policies right there um, equally? favor all participation domains, like parenthood or yeah. work or leisure equally, or? I wish they did. They well, what are, can you give us your thoughts about that? I mean, I mean, let's be blind, right? I mean, disability groups are special interest groups, right? So, and I mean, one of the biggest myths sometimes is this idea that, you know, disability rights as a you know, as a unified. Mm -hmm. It's not and at all. Not at all, it's exactly. Not at all. So, it's not a monolith. And so one of the things that, uh, so let me tell you sort of um, my experience in Dublin, which is actually sort of the time, I, mean, I lived there for six years, just at the time, and some of you may know this, but um, uh, Ireland officially had the first rights-based disability legislation in 2005, Disability Bill 2005. But the process going up to there was, was actually, you know, I mean, it was a joke. It was an absolute joke. Uh, first, uh, the, the, basically the government decided to institute rights-based legislation without even consulting the actual disability groups, who then rightly picketed. It was, it was actually brilliant. I mean, we had, you know, whole days of, uh, you know, I mean, Ireland is a very small country, so, you know, everyone knows where the Prime Minister lives and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, so there was like, you can imagine, <laughs> right? Lots of wheelchairs well. in front of the Prime Minister garage and he couldn't leave the door and, and all these sort of things. So, but, you know, it drew a lot of attention. So, so they retracted the bill uh, and said, no, 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 we'll now do this with proper consultation. So, at which point you had a huge amount of disability groups being consulted. And when I actually looked through these disability groups, I found that all these signals were like a dozen disability groups being consulted, who actually were made up of five people, I think. <laughs> so, you know, lots of political entrepreneurs in the disability rights field were members of several groups. Uh, you know, um, for example, visual impairment was extremely visible. Pun on it, but, uh, but then other groups, you know, and we know the usual suspects here, right? You know, um, um, mental disabilities and so on and so forth. I mean, things like autism and so on. I mean, this is, 
extremely lower on it, right? Um, so, so, so my point to this question basically is to say that you know we really need to think about this as part of general <coughs> politics, and the idea that you know this will, in some sense, there be sort of general legislation of policy benefiting everyone, is it's not going to happen. Um, I'll leave it at that. There's actually, I might even have a chance to come back to this Ireland because the, the, the weird story doesn't end there. But we'll see. Oh, you can't leave us with that. Yeah? Well, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, cliffhanger. I'll, 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 in very, very short, uh, one thing I, I just wanted to say. So, Ireland got this disability bill. The government was very keen to have rights based legislation, but not lawyer led. So, and they were always pointing at, you know, the United States, not you guys, but, you know, and saying that that's the last thing we want. We want the money to go to disabled people, not to the lawyers, which kind of makes sense. So, what he ended up having is a system where people were entitled to have a disability assessment. And if they didn't get the disability assessment or they didn't agree, they, they, didn't agree, they could put a complaint to the complaints officer who's basically the guy next door in the department. Right? So it's like you know the same people having coffee with each other, having lunch. So the complaints officer then reviews the, you know, the, the file of the friend next door and can decide yes or no, this is justified or no. And if the person disagrees with that judgment, they can go to the appeals officer who again sits the office next door. <laughs> So the whole rights-based legislation, at some point you wonder, so where is the independent kinds of core judiciability coming into? It's like, well, the only way in which you could bring the courts in was if these processes weren't followed. So if at some point the assessment officer or the complaints officer or the appeals officer says, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at this, then you could go to the courts. But the moment they all looked at this and said, well, stamp bad or good or whatever, it was all done. So let me tell, where do you think this rights-based disability legislation has gotten anywhere? Mm -hmm. It's there on the books. Well, but what's ironic about it is that it's completely focused on the individual rather sure. than the systems. Mm -hmm. You Absolutely. know, rather than, mm -hmm. I mean, which is kind of getting, a, it's, it's the old medical model mm -hmm. rather than the social model, which is totally ironic. Okay. So, so, so one, I mean, um, one, one of the reasons, because this was, of course, taken into account partly and people were making these sort of uh, uh, complaints but then you know as you can imagine the government always had this little thing and say that well it's up to the local communities to decide whether they have the funding to accommodate all of this so what you have is you know many many years of you know consultation and, and, and involvement of disability groups legislation which was promoted as the first rights based legislation disability legislation in Europe and it's a roundabout you know, it's like, how do you call that, this little thing for the kids? It just people, pe people who get into the system just be turning around and around and around and they're not getting any better. And then, of course, the crisis happened. The Celtic tiger died and, you know, there was a little dead kitten. And after that, no, no one talks anymore. Disability services in Ireland is gone, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. so that's you know, a sad story of, you know, it kind of answers, that's my experience of of a country, so whatever you do, don't go to the Irish place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a question for you, Joy, on how you got uh, the governmental um, instances to provide funding for your environmental-led uh, intervention where you have these uh, mentors that are subsidized. Uh, because I find this is, uh, you know, like, it's like you have sometimes technological innovation is difficult to get it funded and it's very concrete <laughs> products and you were able to do that for a social innovation, so I'm wondering how is it, how did you make it? <laughs> Well, the lawsuits in the States helped a lot for us. So, you know, again, you can see our mode here, right, is again, to prove that it was a civil rights violation and ergo the state could no longer just say no blatantly, right, you know, kind of thing. Um, but then from there, it was, um, I think it, it had a lot to do, we worked a lot on documenting evidence, right? And, and again, you know, like the f functional, we did informed risk contracting, you know, kind of thing where it wasn't just showing somebody was unsafe, but it was then saying, okay, you're already in violation of rights here. You need to try some supports. Let's do it. We'll, do, we'll give you an intervention that allows people to safely try out these things. 
and by the end of it, you, the state, you know, get a report on risk management, right? You know, like which ones of these things. So we actually documented risk and reduced risk and um, worked with the disability communities to get a risk checklist that they documented and a strategy checklist about every session they did, what did they cover, and what skills were learned. And, and we actually had them then, like we did a budget on you know, financing your community living expenses and what would you do, we did an emergency backup plan. And they had a document, you know, like if there's something happens to me, this is what I'll do. And we made a photocopy of it and sent it to the state and said, product done, product done, product done. Here's the skills that they got that are fundable, like emergency management risk reduction is how we sold it. They got a lot more than that, <laughs> but that's how we sold it. So fear was a big factor, right? In, in um, yes. For the state of Illinois, it was the only way oh. that they would ever change. Now, different states are very different. Illinois pointedly thumbed their nose at civil rights for institutionalization for decades you know, kind of thing, and it finally was the, you know, you really are in violation. You can't just say we can't afford it anymore. You know, you need to be providing these community supports. So that helped us. They were in violation. They were nervous. They were upset. You know, they needed some entree. Um, but it was more the evidence-based part of it, I think. And, and find the lingo that speaks to them. For us, it was risk reduction. That was the risk management. It was the term of the day in the state. <laughs> And so we did it in a very, you know, flipped way of, you know, risk management from a consumer-directed way. Um, but we also gave them a risk report, right, that actually showed from an OT perspective how did we decrease the risks, you know, and what supports worked and which ones didn't, you know, for folks. And that was compelling to the state. Yeah, I'm very interesting the three of you together. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the freedom goes very well with participation, I think. Um, and um, I think uh, the way you introduced uh, uh, the definition of freedom at the beginning was interesting. Um, because I, I can see it 